So we'll start with alcohol use and abuse. So the DSM-5 has criteria for substance use disorder, and we've talked about the general criteria earlier, so now we'll talk specifically about alcohol or about those criteria using alcohol as an example. So to meet the criteria, you would an individual would need to have two or more symptoms occurring within a 12-month period, and that would indicate a disorder. But the severity of the disorder, which is now how it's categorized, the severity of AUD, alcohol use disorder, is defined as either mild, that is, they have two to three of the symptoms, moderate, they have four to five symptoms, or severe, six or more symptoms. So what are the symptoms? First of all, we have symptoms indicating impaired control. So we might have alcohol taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than intended. A person goes out to have a drink or two and ends up drinking the night away. Um, two, there is a persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to cut down or control alcohol use. Um, so the person is always saying, oh, I've got to stop drinking, and then doesn't seem to be able to do it. Thirdly, there's a great deal of time spent in activities necessary to obtain alcohol, use alcohol, or recover from its effects. So this person is uh, really dedicating a good bit of their um, time, either lost, seeking out, trying to get the substance, or then with the hangover the next day. And there's a craving or a strong desire or urge to use alcohol. Um, it's hard for the person to walk, place, walk past a place associated with alcohol and not use it. Then there's some social impairment linked to it, and the symptoms defining social impairment include recurrent alcohol use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. So this is the functionality. So is this person missing school or work or falling asleep at school or work? Is this person fighting with the family or be not able to provide for the family? Um, are those kinds of things happening? Six, continued alcohol use despite having persistent recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused by or exacerbated by the effects of alcohol. So those are those fights the person might be getting into or um, difficulties with someone else at work or at home. And seven, important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of, in this case, in this example, alcohol use. So social, occupational, or recreational activities given up because of alcohol use. And so we can think of as this person often staying home or going out and missing family functions, missing time with the family, um, missing days at work, missing sports team. Third, the criteria of risky behavior is indicated by number eight, recurrent alcohol use in situations where it's physically dangerous. So maybe they're driving a car or in some other way putting themselves in danger that could make it worse with alcohol. And nine, alcohol use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent and recurrent physical or psychological problem that's likely to have been caused or exacerbated by alcohol. So there's uh, maybe this person having liver problems, physical problems, or maybe their depression is worsening. And even so, they're still continuing to drink. And finally, tolerance or withdrawal. We've already talked about these on an early, earlier slide, but tolerance is a need for increased amounts of the alcohol in this, in this case to achieve the effects that a person wants. And this is because of biochemical changes, meaning that we now, the body has become accustomed to the substance, in this case, alcohol, and, and so it metabolizes it more quickly, so the person needs more. Um, and withdrawal, physical symptoms that accompany abstinence from a substance. So does this person suffer from some of the withdrawal symptoms you'll see in a little video later on? Uh, figure one, um, we'll start with some data. So um, first off, we're looking at some categories. So binge drinking is uh, defined as consuming more than five alcoholic drinks in one sitting. And heavy drinking means that binge drinking is engaged in more than five times a month. And so 
Um, we, what we look at here in the light blue, we have people who use alcohol but don't binge. In the middle range of blue, we have people who binge but their use is not five, frequent enough to be heavy. And the dark blue is heavy alcohol use. So you can see that the highest alcohol use is among uh, uh, adults age 21 to 25 with declining rates up into really rates that are pretty consistent up until the late 40s and then slightly declining rates into the 50s and markedly declining rates at the age of 65. Um, with binge drinking the heaviest also among those young adults. So we have quite a young age of alcohol use beginning as of 2005. Um, alcohol use and abuse by ethnicity. Um, we do have, and this is um, percent using in the past month, so we do actually have high use among the most people um, who are white people. So we have the highest current use, although the binge drinking is lower among people who are white um, and uh, heavy alcohol use is also higher among white groups than other groups. Um, we can compare that with other racial groups. We find that among American Indians, overall use is among the lowest. However, the binge use is still among the highest. So m fewer people use alcohol, but among those that do, the use is heavier. So um, another statistical finding. The percent of individuals exceeding the daily drinking minute for young people, then teasing that out a little bit. And this is a different, all of these are different data sources and different times. So this is 2006. Um, and we did find that among those young people, we had considerably higher rates of alcohol use, 29.4% and 24.8%. Um, that, that is among 18 to 20 year olds and 21 to 24 year olds. So that seems to be where the higher rates are emerging. Um, and that's relative to other ethnic groups, which is what this middle row is showing. The, we don't have a breakout by ethnic group, but we do find um, the, the heavier use in general among men than among women in both age categories. And among college students and non-college students, we have higher rates among college students in both age categories than among non-college students. Alcohol is associated with more than 40% of deaths and serious injuries in car accidents each year. So drinking while driving is a significant problem. So the experience of alcohol addiction crosses racial, socioeconomic, and age lines, meaning that it occurs regardless of one's racial socioeconomic status or age. Usually the onset is gradual, not sudden, um, meaning that one does not have a drink for the first time and feel addicted, but rather it's a gradual increase to use that proves to be um, difficult to stop. Within the body, the liver is caused to overwork to metabolize alcohol, and so that leads eventually to stiffening of blood vessels in liver or cirrhosis of the liver, where it's no longer functioning in its general um, role in digestion within the body. Behaviorally, we uh, people who have uh, developed addiction to alcohol would have altered judgment and behavior. Um, eventually, it can lead to psychosis, which is the um, difficulty perceiving what's real and what's not real, or experiences of delusions, things that aren't real. And alcohol withdrawal delirium involves disorientation, hallucinations, uh, very often visual, seeing things that aren't there, fear, suggestibility, uh, meaning that you're uh, more likely to believe things that you hear, uh, and tremor, so a kind of a shaking. And alcohol amnestic disorder used to be called Korsakoff syndrome, and that's um, a memory defect for recent ev events and confabulation or the exaggeration of stories that may have happened in small part. And this results from a lack of vitamin B. So there are some 
severe symptoms once alcohol abuse becomes significant. So you will be watching a video that will describe this um, slide to you in some detail. This is going over the withdrawal symptoms that people, people tend to have and the timeline in which they tend to have those characteristics. And so I will leave that to you to watch in the video and that is on our webpage. Um, so one factor that impacts the likelihood of abusing alcohol later is the age of initiation or the age at which an individual took their first um, intoxicating substance. So that could be alcohol, it could be marijuana and inhaling, so typically the three that I looked at. Um, so they are associated with a number of negative outcomes and substance use trajectories. So the earlier, if you have an early initiation that is less than the age of 14, you have already been initiated with an inhalant, alcohol, or with marijuana, you're more likely to drink subsequently. You're more likely to have alcohol-related problems in adulthood. You have an increased chance for developing a substance use disorder of any sort, and increased likelihood of unintentional injuries in motor vehicle, motor vehicle crashes while drinking. Um, and I thought this was a compelling statement made in the study. The odds of developing an alcohol dependence disorder can be decreased anywhere from 5% to 9% for each year that drinking is delayed. So if you have a child, if you can keep that child from drinking even one year later than they might otherwise have started drinking, the, their prognosis in terms of becoming a regular substance user or abuser is much better. Marijuana, um, I did not produce for you the results of, of inhalants, but I did include marijuana. The effects of early marijuana use also lead, and this again is before the age of 14, also leads to increased risk for negative outcomes, occupational relationship and legal problems linked to associated with early marijuana use, adult substance use disorders, being an injection drug user, cognitive and executive functioning defects, subsequent use of other drugs, including opiates, development of various psychiatric disorders, including mood, anxiety, and personality disorders, and delinquency and other problem behaviors. So the percent of individuals becoming dependent on or abusing alcohol by the age of first drink. So if the age at first drink was 14 or younger, we can see that the likelihood, 14 per 8 percent, are likely to either abuse or, in the dark blue area, become dependent on alcohol. Um, that's much reduced, you can see, if that age is delayed till the age of 15 to 17. Even more if the age of initiation is 18 to 20, and even more if the person doesn't take their first drink until 21 or older. Now we're looking at correlations, and correlations have always a logical flaw in that um, you can't assume that there's a direct linear relationship between taking that first drink and later dependence because the factors that cause an individual to drink at the age of 14 or younger may in fact be the factors that are contributing to the later dependence um, or abuse of alcohol. Um, and what percent of children are using these substances? This is broken out by ethnicity. Um, we do have um, percent of children aged 20, 12 to 17 who used alcohol, cigarettes, or marijuana in the past month. Um, and we can see that these rates are higher among our American Indian Alaska Native people for alcohol. They're equal to white people. Um, for cigarette substances, they're considerably higher, and for marijuana, they're higher among our American Indian or Alaska Native population. We also have higher use among white people um, for cigarettes, uh, marijuana, and alcohol when compared with um, Black or Hispanic individuals. And this chart pertains, this chart is comparing results of two different surveys. Um, one is a general survey of the general population regarding um, 
whether they've used alcohol, had, had they had any experience with alcohol, binge drinking, or marijuana um, prior to that, prior to the survey. So they were either in eighth grade, tenth grade, or twelfth grade. And then the other one was actually a different survey, but asking the same questions of American Indian or Alaska Native people. And so we can see that in eighth grade, the American Indian Alaska Native people had significantly higher likelihood, more than twice the likelihood of using alcohol in eighth grade compared to the general population. Um, less, less so in 10th grade, more of white people by then had used it or of the general population, I should say, that would also include Native people. Um, and by 12th grade, the general population had greatly increased its use. So it's this bar, this eighth grade use, that's the most striking with respect to alcohol. And we have similar results um, with, again, our Amer American Indian population having higher results in eighth grade for binge drinking and still even slightly higher in 10th grade. The asterisks here mean that it was still signif statistically significant. Um, and then by 12th grade, again, the general population had had that first binge drinking experience. And for marijuana, the usage was higher throughout for the American Indian population. And this is the significance of this isn't, it, it's simply that the likelihood of later abuse increases with earlier use. So that's why subsequent studies, um, there's quite a lot of work done on this out of the University of New Mexico looking at what, um, what, why do we have this early use, which is so linked to later abuse in this particular population. So I tried to tease that out a little bit. Um, there's a lot to be learned. This is a study. Um, so the previous slide was showing these two different surveys and comparing general population with American Indian Native American populations. But in this slide, the question, the researchers were trying to answer the question of a criticism of their study, which was that the general population may not have had living conditions similar to the American Indian population and that those living conditions might account for the difference. And so these researchers um, sought to compare people in similar living conditions who were American Indian and who were not. And so they looked at, um, th you can see four regions of the country, and they looked specifically at people, Native and non-Native people, who were living on the reservation or in the border towns. And they, so then they were attending the same schools and living in the same communities as the native population. They thought that would be a better comparison. And the age of initiation for American Indian and white females, the American Indian represented in this darker bar, the white um, represented in the lighter bar. And you can see that this use was in fact earlier, even if the conditions were same for females. And there were some variances across the tribal for males across the various tribal regions. And so the Southwest and Northern Plains um, are represented in this bar. The upper Great Lakes are represented in this higher, highest rate. And then they're compared to, um, to white people living in those same reasons. So the triangles are representing the white um, people living in the Northern Plains or the Southwest. And this bar with the X's represents the white people living in the upper Great Lakes. So we do have something kind of distinctive going on in terms of the earliness of use. And so the researchers that are doing this work, this study is from 2015. And um, I said New Mexico, but this researchers are actually from Colorado State University. And um, so they're trying to answer these questions and they had a few um, ideas that they hypothesized. I'll show results from one of them a little bit later in terms of why this might be, but the work is ongoing and the process is not really well understood right now. Um, again, the significance is that early use is strongly correlated with later abuse. So getting at this early use is what the challenge is. Um, now, the causes of addiction are addressed a bit in this little clip, which I will run for you right now. The 
when we look more closely at the, at the behavioral pharmacology or the biology of addiction, we see that there's a biological normality to it. Experts have learned that addiction to drugs or alcohol is a disease that has genetic as well as environmental triggers. We found that a gene involved in dopamine metabolism is important. Dopamine is the brain's pleasure chemical. It's what makes you feel good if you have a pleasurable experience. And for high novelty seekers, doing something new like bungee jumping or having a new drug or even a new sexual partner uh, releases dopamine and makes people feel good. What this gene does is it controls how the brain responds to dopamine. So people with one version of the gene don't get much of a thrill from doing something new. They tend to be low novelty seekers. People with a very slightly different version of the gene respond much more positively to dopamine. And they're the people who are likely to be jumping out of an airplane or trying a new drug. There clearly are genetic risks. Um, people do differ as a function of something that's being transmitted genetically from family to family. When you look at certain family complexes, you can see these multi-generational, multi-affected families where the risk is just so high for the people becoming alcohol or drug users or abusers. Certainly we know that the alcoholism area uh, children of alcoholics are uh, at about a threefold risk of becoming alcoholic themselves compared to children of non-alcoholics. And the pr appropriate control studies have been done with adoptees and with twins to indicate that this is a genetically determined vulnerability. There have been very elegant studies showing that, for example, if one of a pair of identical twins is a cigarette smoker, the co-twin is more likely to be a heavy drinker. And that suggests that it's the same genes that are involved in smoking and alcohol drinking, just being expressed differently in different people. So this co-occurrence uh, may represent a, a general vulnerability factor that may be reflected in, in personality characteristics that are genetically determined. People with family histories, uh, people with comorbid psychiatric disorders, uh, are at higher risk. Psychological distress, uh, another emotional illness, depression, anxiety, are highly associated with drug use. I've never met anybody who is abusing anything that doesn't have some small underlining mental health issue. Because before you picked up the first drink, you probably didn't feel good about yourself. Or before you chewed it, or even smoked the first cigarette, Low self-esteem take you low. Mm -hmm. You don't feel good about yourself. You feel different. And that's one of the characteristics of um, most addicts. So let's tease out a couple of those ideas that they brought forward to us. So the causes of substance use disorders, as was mentioned in the film, there are some genetic factors and there are social heritability factors. So we have this child here who may have inherited a gene from his mother that leads him to be more likely to abuse drugs, but he also inherits the social acceptiveness of this, having this, you know, they're playing a game and here's the alcohol right around right around him. And so his susceptibility is increased both because of his possible genetic package and the social environment that he's in. Um, so in parents who use drugs and alcohol, both modeling and inattentive parenting play a role. So in this case, we have this modeling of the social acceptability of alcohol, but we also then might have the consequences of this for the parent. So does the parent want to engage the child on, let's say, um, seeing that they get their homework done or dealing with a disciplinary matter if they're drinking or under the influence of some drug, perhaps they're better off, they're gonna feel better if they just distract the child or keep the child from bothering them. And that can be a factor in this addictive cycle. Stress, um, life disorientation and anxiety can lead someone to feel that the alcohol is giving them a sense of relief. They are less aware of or less impacted by their problems in that moment of drinking. Of course, we know that just from the little bit that we've looked at, that anxiety is likely to increase as you um, come to become dependent on alcohol. So it's a very um, ineffective short-term 
relief to that stress and anxiety. Um, expectations, your desire to meet social goals might lead you. So if you are a quieter person and you want to engage with people more and you're having a bit of anxiety, then the alcohol can relieve that. And once you have a social anxiety relieved in one situation, you may be inclined to use alcohol again in hopes that it would relieve it in another situation. Intimate relationships, shared habits, enabling and relationship challenges. So you might have a partnership um, with somebody. M maybe you got through your social anxiety and found a partner um, through using alcohol to facilitate social situations. And in that case, your partner might have similar habits to you. So whereas if you were not with this particular partner, you might not have the habit of drinking at a certain time or in certain situations, but because you are with this partner, you both enable each other. Um, and um, if, likewise, if you have challenges within a relationship, a person may turn to alcohol as another way of soothing the emotions on a temporary basis. Cultural factors um, like drinking norms. Um, I know from Wisconsin, where I am from, a very German population with a heavy drinking history and drinking is a part of every social occasion um, from the time I was pretty young. And it's not generally heavy drinking, but it's certainly, you know, fitting the social norm of beer being a part of many social environments. Um, my brother is an engineer and he's worked as an engineer he, in three different states, I think four different states. And every place that he's worked for as a professional engineer has had a refrigerator with beer in it. So that's another example of a drinking norm. Um, coming to college, uh, you know, for the first time, uh, college, um, typical university, there are some norms for drinking as part of your initial college experience, and such norms may be present even in high school. So that's another aspect that we can think about. What are the norms? What is presented to you as normal drinking? Psychological vulnerability. Um, we may have people who are suffering from anxiety or depression who turn to alcohol or other substances for some relief from that psychological distress they're feeling. And so that results in comorbidities um, of potentially a substance use disorder in conjunction with this other underlying anxiety or personality disorder or um, mood disorder, whatever an individual is experiencing can be comorbid with substance use. Typically, if we're going to treat then, we, we need to deal with the substance abuse first. It's very hard to treat an underlying disorder if there's an overriding condition um, of a substance use disorder. Um, I looked up a little bit of work here to understand a little more about the dynamic. This is a Swayman Stanley who presented the earlier work. Um, the Effects of Family Conflict and Anger on Alcohol Use Among American Indian Students. And so we can see that they were hypothesizing about what might contribute to this early alcohol use that leads to greater substance use. And so you can see that, uh, and these are students, so this is looking at a younger population. And so they were speculating, does anger make people have an alcohol? Does family conflict make people use alcohol or is it a combination? And so they found that anger and family co conflict were fairly highly correlated and that independently, however, these things didn't seem to impact alcohol involvement. What impacted alcohol involvement were differences that emerged from these combined factors in outcome expectancies. So then these young people who had anger and family conflict in their lives ended up having reduced expectancies for good outcomes for themselves. And it was in that sort of hopelessness that reduced optimism about where they could go in their life that the alcohol involvement came into play. Um, so I hope that made sense to you. So that does offer a role for anyone who wants to work with such individuals dealing with family conflict and anger, that if they can be given hope 
they can be given a light, a reason, a, an opportunity through the school or through um, outdoor mentorship or a leader within the community, some other way to feel that their outcome is still promising. That's going to, it suggests that they would be less likely to become involved with alcohol, although these are correlational findings. So they're not suggesting causality. There are individual difference factors. Um, first off, we have reward deficiency syndrome. So what that means, if we, you heard in the video that dopamine is linked to our reward system. And so if you, um, if your body, your receptors, your ability to receive the pleasurable feeling from dopamine, then you will need to have more of that pleasurable activity in order to feel good. And that's called reward deficiency syndrome. And some individuals experience that and that can lead them to abuse a drug or alcohol. <clears throat> the amount that would make one person feel gratified or feel pleasure, it would take more for this other person to feel that same pleasure. And so that would lead them into an addictive cycle. Another factor relates to personality. Um, Biz Baz is a personality comparison that identifies two systems, people with two tendencies. One is a behavior inhibitory style. It means that they tend to make their decisions on how to act or what to do based on potential risks. So they're holding back all the time. They're saying, well, I don't know, that might be dangerous. So that's considered a personality type. People with that type tend to make those same cautious decisions across situations. And the opposite is BAS, behavioral activation system. People who have that as a dominant uh, characteristic are guided by potential pleasure. So they're making decisions by like, oh, that might feel good. So rather than considering the risks, they're considering the potential pleasures and being more likely to dive forward into new things. And I'll bring this forward again a little bit later when we talk about opiates, but we do know at this juncture that BAS dominant people have a greater likelihood of addiction because they're diving toward pleasure in a more dominant way than BIS dominant people. So we treat, we can treat alcoholics with drugs, medications, or with psychology. Antabuse is one drug that's used, and what is trying to be done with antabuse is it causes violent vomiting if alcohol is ingested, and that means that um, they're trying to create a negative association. So they're trying to get the person's biology to link vomiting to alcohol. And as you know, if you've ever eaten some sort of a spoiled food and gotten sick, you develop sort of a revulsion for that food. And so the antabuse is seeking to give an individual a sort of revulsion to alcohol. Naltrexone blocks pleasure receptors linked to drinking. So if it no longer feels pleasurable to drink, and this is the Sinclair method you'll be watching in a case, um, if you no longer feel pleasure in drinking, then you're less likely to drink. Your reward system is not activated. And tranquilizers, um, a big symptom of withdrawal from alcohol is anxiety. Like you, you, there's a, a sense of anxiety until you have that drink again, and then you can relax. So a tranquilizer, while also addictive in some cases, can um, help a person break away and get through that worst withdrawal phase from alcohol. With psychology, um, typically we would offer group therapy like AA, which has a really unique approach we'll look at in a moment. Environmental intervention, that is changing the situation in which a person is embedded that gives them like opportunities to drink or like the, the habits in which one drinks. Um, aversion counseling, conditioning, um, is similar to the antabuse, except it's done without a drug. The idea is that an individual would um, have, say, some sort of an aversive, whenever every time they took a drink, something would happen to them, like a shock, for example, or something unpleasant they would experience. They would be deliberately exposed to something unpleasant at the same time as they're exposed to the alcohol with the idea again that they would develop a sort of aversion to the alcohol. 
and the one you've heard about so many times before, cognitive behavioral therapy, that is addressing the thinking and the um, behavioral rewards and helping a person to change their behavior by looking at those two dimensions. Some things that might come into play would be education, stress management, modifying the way you think about it. Like if you think at a social party that you have to be the life of the party, that might be a cognition that would be modified and modify your expectations um, about what you about what you can and can't be, either modifying upward in terms of there is still hope for you if you're a young person in that family conflict situation, or modifying um, um, modifying expectations downward for how, how good and how charming you have to be. Alcoholics Anonymous is, it still doesn't have the the best supportive evidence um, because in the end most people who quit alcohol are making the decision to quit alcohol and AA facilitates and supports that decision. However, AA is very good at facilitating and supporting the decision to get people off alcohol. So um, it's socially supportive, it makes people look at themselves very frankly um, and it helps it, it helps for the individual to be humble, um, to realize that alcohol addiction is bigger than they are. Um, and so that brings about a kind of humbleness and a willingness to accept help. Um, and without that humbleness, it's harder to, to lick it. These are the 12 steps of Alcoholic Anonymous. It's admitting to that powerlessness. It's there's a religious sort of a feeling to it. Um, they came to believe that a power, they needed to rely on a power greater than themselves to quit the alcohol. And so they surrendered. They turned over their will and their lives to the care of God, however they understood him. And that could be, uh, it, that, that can be aligned with, um, you know, a, a wide variety of religious or spiritual interpretations. They made a searching and fearless moral inventory themselves. They looked themselves frankly for what they were. Um, they admitted their wrongs. They were ready to have these defects of character removed. And so they asked for this to be removed. They made a list of people they had harmed and expressed a willingness to make amends to them. They wanted to make up the harm they had caused. And then they made such amends whenever it was possible. That is, it acknowledging to that person the harm they had caused and doing what they could to make it right. Continuing to take that personality and admit that they were wrong. Um, using prayer, meditation to improve consciousness, awareness of, let's say, of the, we could characterize it as God as it's written here, and we could characterize it as the greater um, presence within us all, or. Um, or chi, it does not have to be the God that in the Christian tradition people are most familiar with. And then having had a spiritual awakening because of these steps and to help others. So um, with that, we close the section on alcohol and the next section will be related to um, opiates. Um, and I take back that word that I said at the end of the last slide because I did put some more in here um, in terms of what are the barriers to getting help. And this does focus on American Indian people. And you can see that personal barriers were present for quite a large proportion of people, including things like I like drinking, I like getting drunk, drinking is a way of life. And these are a relatively small sample. But of the small sample, these personal barriers were a strong factor um, of those who were potentially abusing alcohol. I thought I could handle it on my own. And these are people who have sought, these are people who have sought help, but why they didn't get help sooner. So what were the barriers? They were afraid they would fail. They thought help was for people who had worse problems, didn't know how they would live without drinking, didn't know they had a problem. 
A second aspect of the barriers that they faced before they actually got help is they didn't want to listen. They didn't want to have someone tell them what to do with their life. They didn't want someone to tell them to stop drinking and go to these 12 step groups. They didn't think it would do any good. They felt more private. They felt more protective. Um, you know, they didn't want to put themselves out there. And that is this attitude is sort of contrary to that humbleness that one must assume to participate in AA. Um, there are social network barriers. Um, there are friendships that are based in alcohol. Um, thinking family would be embarrassed. Um, uh, and then there are pragmatic barriers. Um, it seemed like it was just too much trouble or they didn't know where to go or time or to get someone to, to pay the money for help or maybe they're worried they would lose their job. So those were some really pragmatic barriers. And I think I put this up here because it can be quite helpful to understand um, what, you know, how can we address these? So we could address some of these pragmatic barriers, right, by making help more readily accessible. The social network barriers, now that might be harder for us to address, um, you know, but you can see how this could be a helpful list to have because maybe some of these can be smoothed out by others and some of these have to be internal shifts. And as far as laws, um, overall, um, laws tend to put behaviors into, for, laws are effective for people who were unlikely to use the drug in the first place. That keeps them from using, it gives them an extra little boost for not using the drug or the alcohol. But for people who are susceptible or people who are likely to use it, having the law in place just makes it more hidden, more clandestine. And in the case of the laws um, in our country, I, I think that most of you are well aware that un, the drinking age is 21 in this country and that a large majority of people drink before the age of 21, so they break the law. And so the consequence is not of the prohibitions. Um, it, it doesn't really prevent drinking but it keeps it hidden so that young people, for example, are drinking in the presence of other young people because they have to hide it from the adults who might know more about responsible drinking. And that really contributes to some of the poor decision making, the binge drinking or the, the behaviors that come of excess drinking when people are just learning about alcohol. And so without the benefit of role models, as opposed to in Europe, um, such prohibitions and ages based on drinking don't exist. And so children can learn to drink very moderately in situations with adult role models with their family. And that's different if you took these two young people and they were off drinking on their own, they would be much more likely to go overboard. Whereas now if they're having this small glass of wine, with a, a family member or a parent, or they're seeing their parents and family members drink just one glass of wine with this meal, they're having much better role modeling and much better opportunity to learn about what alcohol is and what it does within the protective sanctum of the family. So um, we'll offer that much in terms of what the law is doing. Now we'll be able to explore that a bit more as uh, cannabis, marijuana is now legal and increasingly legal in states throughout the country. And now we go on to these addictive processes and to opiate addiction.